my name is Michelle Morand. I am a precision cancer medicine educator and advocate. And for 14 years, I've been helping cancer patients all around the world access the most beneficial therapies for their cancer, get their doctors on board and get some coverage through the healthcare system. Um, and I'm here with this fellow, Alexander Rowland, the cancer guy, uh, co-founder of Cancer Treatment Options and Management and Liquid Biopsy Labs. Um, Alex is uh, the uh, expert in figuring out what it is that cancer patients need. Um, and so he's here today to share a, a really exciting new type of therapy. It's, it's exciting for people with stage four colon cancers, but also the implications of this therapy for all other types of cancer are really quite profound. So um, we're just gonna take you on a little journey for the next few minutes. Alex, tell us all about this new therapy and how it's gonna benefit all cancer patients, not just colon cancer patients. Yeah, so this is an exciting new approach to treating uh, colon cancers. Um, and it really it really kind of gets at a fundamental concept that has been adhered to by the medical system for many years. And that is that once a cancer has metastasized, um, you can't really eradicate it properly. That is probably based on the fact that, you know, there's lots of micro metastasis that we don't really see on scans. Scans can't really pick up micro metastasis. Uh, very few imaging techniques can pick up tumors smaller than half a centimeter. And in general, um, you know, when primary treatment is done on a, on a uh, cancer that has metastasized, it's just assumed that there's tumors all over the body that may or may not grow. And mm -hmm. so often doctors are reluctant to do extra surgery or, you know, major surgery in this case mm -hmm. to extend the lives. They feel it's not really worth it because the cancer is just going to come back anyways. Right. But I think I think this really needs to be um, delved into in yeah. detail because uh, we know that a big part of of getting rid of cancer is getting rid of the the fundamental niche where the cancer exists, and that's not necessarily where the tumor is. That could be you know five six centimeters away from the tumor itself. Um, so it's really important to remove the fundamental niche where the stem cells exist that have caused that tumor. Um, and then as well as the tumor microenvironment, because all of these factors contribute to metastasis and growth. Yeah. And I think this study here really uh, exemplifies the importance of that and how it can result in very long term uh, survival rates. For late stage patients. I just want yeah. to add something to clarify. Um, this is a little tweak uh, to what you were saying earlier, which is. One of the main reasons why surgery is often taken off the table once there's metastasis is because with the old types of therapies that were available, which really was surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, once there's metastasis, it isn't likely that the solution is going to be curative. Um, so we need to understand that there, there are lots of really excellent targeted therapies and different types of therapies now that are changing that, but the medical system hasn't necessarily caught up. So um, they're still kind of under this old paradigm that if we can't solve the problem, we're not going to do the surgery. Um, but that, yeah, that this just really helps to even reinforce the benefit of surgery for people. So tell us all about it. Yeah. So uh, this is all about um, liver transplantation in stage four colon cancers. First off, uh, the standard care for colon cancer is typically surgery, chemo, and radiation therapy. Uh, the chemo can be done prior to surgery in a neoadjuvant setting or post-surgery as an adjuvant or both. Uh, once the cancer is spread to the liver, surgery offers only limited benefits and therefore is, is not usually offered if it's unresectable, well, if it's unresectable, it can't be removed anyways. Um, and this is um, this is specifically challenging uh, because colon cancers often have a liver metastasis at diagnosis. So it's one of the preferential organs that colon cancers and many other cancers metastasize to. Um, liver metastasis is a real issue in cancer. The reason is, is that the liver uh, is an organ that has a excellent growth environment for tumor cells. Um, so basically tumors are uh, all created from stem cells and the liver has a high number of stem cells and is able to regenerate itself. In fact, even just one third of the liver is able to grow a new liver. Uh, additionally, there are growth factors, uh, signaling cascades in the liver that promote stem cell and therefore tumor growth. Um, and since cancers are a disease of stem cells, and since the liver provides a perfect growth environment for cancer cells, 
the battle for cancer is usually fought and lost in the liver. There are a bunch of great liver-directed therapies, and these are ways of just targeting the liver itself. Um, TACE is one of them, transarterial chemo immobilization. Uh, this is a specific type of chemo immobilization that blocks a hepatic artery and then um, uses high-dose chemo just into the liver. Uh, there's also radioembolization, which uses something called yttrium Y90. These are little glass beads uh, with a radioactive isotope inject into the liver. There's hepatic arterial infusion, or HAI, and this is basically a uh, pump that's implants, implanted you know, into the body or attached to the body, and it delivers high-dose chemotherapy directly to the liver alone. Uh, there's also many ablation procedures that can use either heat, which is thermal, or cold, which is cryo ablation, um, or even microwaves. And there's also ultrasound ablation now. And then, of course, there's a standard external beam radiation therapy. Uh, and then there's also proton therapy. Now, all of these um, can really help patients with liver metastasis, uh, but they're not a cure. Um, so while these liver-directed therapies do extend survival time significantly, and they can be very expensive, um, and they can be difficult to perform, uh, they are often limited by the size of the tumors. Typically, they work best in tumors at less than three centimeters, and as well as the number of tumors. So if there's a lot of tumors, then it's really not going to be that effective to do a liver-targeted therapy. However, a new trial, the TransMet, um, and I've been watching this one for a while because it's very interesting. Transmet studies showed that in selected patients with unresectable colorectal cancer liver metastasis, in other words, a liver metastasis that, that uh, couldn't be surgically removed, liver transplantation plus chemotherapy significantly boosted overall survival compared with chemotherapy alone. So in this study, patients with unresectable colorectal cancer liver metastasis were treated with chemotherapy alone or in combination with a liver transplant. Uh, the eligibility criteria was very restrictive in this study. Um, and that's because they wanted to make sure, you know, they really uh, defined and characterized the patient population that would benefit from liver transplantation. So uh, patients had to be 65 years or younger. Um, they'd undergone a gold standard resection of the primary tumor. In other words, they had really good clear margins on their primary tumor removal. Um, they had surgery confirmed unresectable liver metastasis. So in other words, the doctors went in there and said, no, we can't do anything here with the liver. Um, you know, there's nothing to do there. Um, they had a good performance status. In other words, they were healthy. They had no extra hepatic disease. In other words, they had no metastasis outside of the liver. It was liver only metastasis. Um, they had a partial response or stable disease after chemotherapy. They had no BRAF mutations. BRAF mutations are a problem with colorectal cancer. They can cause a very aggressive cancer that is treatment resistance. Um, and they also had low CEA or carcinoembryonic antigen levels. This is a marker of um, stem cells, um, and it's often used in different cancers. Um, sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not. But in this particular case, the patients had low levels of that. They also had adequate platelet and white blood cell counts. And so generally, they were pretty healthy patients after their surgery and their, their chemo. The results were just staggering. The five-year overall survival rate for the transplant chemotherapy arm was 57%. So in other words, 57% of patients were alive at five years who had the transplant versus only 13% for chemotherapy alone. Uh, and there's a hazard ratio there. Um, the results were even more favorable for transpla transplantation in the PER protocol analysis. And the PER protocol analysis is basically patients who completed the uh, treatment originally allocated to them. So in other words, they, they didn't have to go through any changes or adaptations or, you know, reductions in chemotherapy or, or any sort of changes to, this, to the original protocols. Um, and these patients had a five-year well, survival rate of 73% versus only 9% for the chemotherapy. Wow. Um, the progression-free rates, in other words, how many patients were still cancer-free at a particular time period, um, was 33% uh, versus... 4% for chemo at three years, which is really good, and 20% versus 0% at, for chemo at five years. So wow. a substantial difference here. Mm. Now, um, of course, there were recurrence rates of these patients. Uh, among the 36 patients in this study who received a transplant, 
uh, 26 or 72% had disease recurrence. 14% or 14 in the lungs, um, three in the lymph nodes, one in the liver and eight at sites or multiple sites. Can I interrupt about that? Yeah. Uh, you're gonna get to this. It doesn't that isn't that simply because we're just using chemo? We haven't done we haven't done proper diagnostics, we haven't got on targeted therapies, we haven't identified the driving mutations. Chemo, chemo is so limited. I wonder what the outcome would have been if they had done proper diagnostics um, and found targeted therapies and and enhanced their transplant with targeted therapy versus chemo. Do you have an opinion on that? I sure do, and I think that's an excellent point. Um, yeah, of course. Um, and I believe in this study, um, don't quote me on this, but if I recall, it was mostly arenotecan based chemo. Okay. So, you know, which is a standard care, it's uh, uh, typically yeah. called fulfiri or capiri if you're having capacitabine. Yeah. Um, so, yes, definitely. Um, the fulfiri and the fulfox for stage four, uh, let's say it's KRAS uh, mutated colorectal cancer is about 26 months overall survival when you combine both chemotherapy protocols and surgery and everything else. Yeah. So um, yeah, you know, it would make a radical difference if we actually did proper patient stratification, looked at the molecular markers and, you know, use targeted therapies and so on, or, or use the proper therapy or, you know, maybe neoadjuvant immune therapy followed by a liver transplant. There's all kinds of different ways of, of slicing this up. So yes, yeah, this is, this is just standard, standard yeah. chemotherapy. And that's as given the point to I want to make for those of you who are watching, because when you see this number, you think, uh, at least if I were you, I might be thinking, oh, I'm going to go through all this and I'm going to end up here. Well, if you follow this protocol, yes, but already today, there are ways to enhance this protocol and change, you know, change the percentage uh, likelihood of recurrence. I just wanted to kind of make that point. For yeah, you. I think that's an excellent point. Yes. Um, among those with disease recurrence after receiving a transplant, um, 12 or 46% underwent rescue surgery or ablation. In other words, they were deemed um, healthy enough uh, to get rescue surgery or some form of ablation to wow. take care of those recurrences. Yeah, so, um, you know, that's a good thing. Altogether, 42% of these patients in the transplant per protocol group had no evidence of disease after 50 months of follow-up. So that's pretty good. In contrast, in the chemotherapy per protocol group, all but one patient had disease progression. So significant differences there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the limitations um, in this, um, almost 40% patients deemed eligible did not ultimately receive a liver. So this shows how difficult it is to actually select the right patients and get them to a transplant. So it's not a simple thing. It's a major surgery and there's a lot of things that need to be considered. But this, this reality is mir mirrored by uh, findings from the liver donor transplant program in Toronto, Canada, where of the 81 patients referred, only seven completed transplant. So that's, you know, not a lot. Now that is Canada, that is Canada and liver transplant is not a regular thing here in Canada. Well, um, yeah, I'd like to see that compared to other facilities. What I'd love to see, because I don't know a lot about transplants, and I don't know about you watching from home, but um, I'd love to understand, like, is that because there weren't enough livers available? Like, how, how much does... This is just a variety of reasons, and that is going to be one of those reasons. Uh, improper matches, there's, there's going to be a variety of different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, timing, uh, you know, ability of surgical units to do this, uh, doctors free... There's all kinds of things that could add to this. And let's face it, in Canada right now, we have a severe crisis. Um, and we have had for quite some time in our medical system. So as I mentioned, I would like to see um, if this um, issue was as bad in other facilities in different countries. But I, I do also want to point out in um, those people that actually did complete the transplant in Toronto, their three-year overall survival was 100%. So... Right. You know, those seven patients got a great benefit. Yes. Yeah. So um, in conclusion, the study changes how we view surgery for cancer patients. And so previous knowledge has assumed that once a cancer is spread, the surgery does not provide significant benefits. That is largely in unstratified patients. And I think this study is a perfect example of how if you properly stratify patients for this sort of you know major surgery, 
uh, you can get long-term benefits from the transplantation. In other words, these patients were healthy. They were deemed to not have any um, cancer left after or minimal amount of cancer left after, you know, prior to the transplant. Um, they got, you know, responses to the chemo and they had a really good resection. So, you know, these patients would have done better anyways, but not to this scale. Not that much better. And when you say no cancer left, obviously there was cancer in the liver. Yes. Of course. But it hadn't gone anywhere else or wasn't wasn't anywhere else. Um, yeah. And again, I just keep wanting to come back for you folks watching at home. All of this data is based on standard diagnostics and no targeted therapies, like no, no new treatments in terms of, of pharmaceuticals. And what we've seen for the last 14 years is when you when you have proper tumor testing and you know the driving mutations of your cancer and your therapy is targeted to those particular mutations all the statistics go get better everything gets better your overall survival side effects all the stuff um as a rule it is so much better so um this is just the start in other words alex what you're sharing here it's the start to show that yes for stage four colon cancer patients with metastasis to liver there's a there is a solution coming around the bend um that can provide you with great benefit this is also good information for everybody about the fact mm -hmm. that we're starting to understand that just because you have metastasis to certain organs does not mean that surgery will not benefit you surgery it can be of great benefit and it'll be of even greater benefit if you have tumor testing and you know the driving features of your cancer and are on a proper targeted therapy regimen rather than just standard chemo. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. as we've talked about before, when we've done um, discussions about clinical trials and studies and all of these things, we, we must understand that these types of studies, when they're being done for the first time, they have to be done kind of with a, a placebo. And the placebo for cancer patients is the standard of care. So they they couldn't they this study couldn't have initially been done on new targeted therapies with the liver transplant because they're tr really trying to show the benefits of this one particular tool, this liver transplant. I would be surprised if there isn't a new study in the works right now looking at targeted therapies and this to see how much how much better it does for people. Yeah, well, there's definitely what they're going to be doing is some um, post-study analysis. They're going to probably stratify based on the molecular basis of each tumor. I mean, you know, for example, if a patient has HER2 amplification or HER2 mutation or PIK3CA or KRAS G12C alterations, you know, all of these different things. Um, can open up the door for targeted therapies. Um, well, you know, standard care um, is really a way of saying this is our bottom line. This is the, you know, one thing we could do across a lot of different patients without spending a lot of time on stratification. Mm, yeah, so a good place to start. And those results, I mean, we highlighted them in red because they really are quite significant. Substantial, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you or someone you know is struggling with cancer right now and just wanting to make sure that you're on the right therapy or wanting help from an expert team to figure out what treatments you need and to advocate with your treatment team for them, that's what we're all about here. You can book in a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Alex. You can join uh, my free Precision Cancer Medicine Education and Advocacy Program. We meet a couple of times a week and I help just answer your questions about what to do next or what 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 you could do to help advocate for yourself. We have our YouTube channel. So do subscribe, stay informed. New videos coming down every week. And we are very eager for your feedback and suggestions about the types of topics you'd like to see videos on. So be a squeaky wheel uh, with us and with your cancer care team and you will have a far better outcome than just standard of care. Thanks for watching.